it is the 100th anniversary of Nosferatu! Now, if you're watching this channel, you, you probably already know at least something about Nosferatu. Uh, I'm sure you know that it was a silent film. You might also know that it was an unauthorized adaptation of the book Dracula. And we almost lost Nosferatu forever because Bram Stoker's widow, Florence Stoker, won a lawsuit to have all copies of Nosferatu destroyed. So it's really a miracle that we have this film to watch today. So as of last week, on, on March 4th, Nosferatu turned 100 from when it originally premiered in Berlin in 1922. And I wanted to do a special episode because I love this movie. And I was like, I can put together an episode all about the stuff that I know about Nosferatu. But then I was like, I kind of want to learn some stuff about Nosferatu too, you guys. So I invited someone who knows a hell of a lot more than I do about this film to join us today. So I'm just gonna button this up to look a little more respectable and this will just be our little secret. Today, we have a once in a hundred year opportunity to talk to the man who is the foremost authority on Nosferatu. And this guy uh, is a noted uh, film historian and scholar, especially when it comes to vampires and monster movies. He has written numerous books, some of which I have on hand right here. And it is my great honor to not only be able to meet today, but to introduce you guys to the one and only David J. Scal. Thank you for Hi. being here. John, thank you for having me. Um, I wouldn't call myself the absolute world's authority on Nosferatu. I probably oh. am very authoritative on certain aspects of, of Nosferatu. Uh, okay. You know, part of German expressionism, which uh, I'm not an art historian, I'm a film historian, but uh, the whole cultural context uh, uh, is a bit beyond my pay grade but I... <laughs> okay could you would you mind uh just uh, for those folks who who maybe are not familiar with the backstory of it could could you go back and talk to us sort of about uh how nosferatu started where it came from and and sort of how it wound up uh getting made well it uh interested not the director fw murnau who was an up-and-coming director he wasn't uh um, the uh, the major world talent he would soon become with uh, with uh, Faust and uh, uh, and then the work he did when he came to America, but uh, the producer a man named Alban Grau G R A U who uh, was also the art director and uh, he created um, we're not sure if they're storyboards or uh, after the fact uh, uh, renditions of frame blowups. But uh, he did a wonderful series of posters, all in a, in a marvelously uh, expressionistic style. And uh, he was an occultist. And um, what? He did, yes, he did not leave a record of uh, his own involvement in, in Nosferatu, but he does seem to have been the driving creative force behind the whole thing. Uh, Murnau never gave an interview about the film. Um, not in Germany and uh, certainly not in the States where really? during his life, never even released. Uh, so we don't know. It's clear though, to, you know, if you look at uh, Faust, what he did for uh, Ufa in 1926-27 and uh, Nosferatu that uh, he was limited by a much, much smaller budget. He didn't have all the resources he would have had at a major studio like uh, uh, like Ufa. Uh, but he did have a talented uh, uh, crew uh, and his cinematographer and Grau was his art director. They were able to do a film that did the cabinet of Dr. Caligari uh, very good. I mean, it was it, it, it's a uh, it's a uh, fabulous uh, 
dance of light and shadow and 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 creepiness. And uh, uh, the funny thing is, it remains one of the better adaptations of Dracula, and maybe the only one that Stoker would even recognize the Count in any <laughs> form that was close to what he he described. You know, his Dracula was a horrible old man who became younger as he drank blood, but he never uh, became attractive and he never seduced anybody. And, uh, and um, uh, Nosferatu went uh, quite a bit further. I mean, they made him into a half uh, human, half rodent and uh, with uh, insect-like fingers. And the film still has the capability of making an audience uh, collectively shudder. I saw a live performance not that many years ago at the cathedral of saint john the divine in new york for halloween and oh wow uh, when uh when uh, max shrek made his uh made his entrance or at least the uh the creepy entrance to uh uh hutter's uh, bedroom the uh you you could just hear the the collective shudder and gasp at just how hideous he was he re it really <laughs> the characterization is the stuff of nightmares and i think bram stoker would have uh, would have appreciated that and it uh it simplifies the story uh it has many things in common with a uh kind of a german fairy tale it's uh uh it, it's really kind of whittled down and um it's a story of good against evil and and the uh uh the heroine um uh, sacrifices herself she keeps nosferatu at her bedside drinking her blood until daylight and uh, he is destroyed and this is the first time a vampire was ever destroyed by daylight it's not part of the dracula legend it's not part of most uh, european legends about uh, about about vampires uh it was something that was uh, invented for the cinema and i guess the old superstition that uh, you know things of evil would uh had to dissipate at, uh, at, at at daybreak, uh, but they created the first image of a vampire being vaporized by the uh, uh, coming of the sun. That's that's fabulous, and I I, I I wanted to ask you, have you found in any of your research any indication of uh, where Murnau would have come up with that idea, or or if not him, then the screenwriter? I think it would have been the screenwriter or uh, Alban Grau probably had his fingers in the screenplay as well. Uh, we just don't know. There isn't enough documentation. Uh, the court battle uh, threw the whole company into bankruptcy and their, their um, records have never been uh, uncovered. Uh, who knows? They might someday. And I think they'd be very, very interesting. But uh, what we can say for sure is that uh, Murnau was up and coming, not a, not a big name. At the time, uh, Grau was passionately committed to uh, th this film. Uh, he hoped it would be the first of uh, a number of supernaturally themed films that uh, his company, Prana Film, uh, Prana meaning Breath of Life, uh, oh, okay. would have uh, done. But all of that, uh, the, uh, the uh, the lawsuit uh, put all that on hold and uh, actually just kiboshed it forever. Well, so so on that on that topic, um, it's always kind of been a, a bit of a mystery to me as to why Prana Films would would take the book Dracula and make a film version of it without you know obtaining permission to do so, uh, because the book was still under copyright and everything like that in Europe. Uh, and uh, do, so do you, do you have any insight into why that decision was made? No, we, ne we never got a transcript of, uh, of the court records. We don't know what kind of defense was put up by, by Prana. Uh, we do know that uh, copyright was in a... a uh, a real transitional period in the late 1890s. Oh, really? uh, there, are different, there are different rules in the, in the United States, different rules in, in Europe. Uh, the whole uh, subject of dramatic copyright 
was quite controversial and things were pirated all over the place. Charles Dickens had this problem much earlier in the, uh, in the 1800s. Uh, his novels were being turned into plays all over the world. Uh, Mark Twain had the same, same problem. And they uh, had, there was a great deal of difficulty uh, enforcing these things because there, 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 there was no, uh, there were no laws that specifically, you know, once something was out there, apparently, you know, often it was treated like it was in the public domain. There wasn't, uh, so I think it was probably a combination of just complete naivete on uh, Piranha Film's part. Uh, they uh, certainly didn't try to hide it. They changed the names of the characters, but in the in, in the credits and all the promotional materials, uh, they included the line, freely adapted from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Wow, so they, were, they weren't even hiding it. Yeah, I mean, it does get into, it, it's kind of, is, is something a, a literary plagiarism is somewhat different than this kind of filmic uh, thing, especially because no actual text is, uh, uh, is, is stolen no character names are, are used. So it's the, the story is this kind of nebulous construction and that wasn't particularly covered by uh, 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 the copyright laws at the time. But it was a mess and things didn't really settle down until um, um, around the time uh, that uh, Stoker died really. It was really the early part of the, the, the 20th century and um, um, it was it was a very very bumpy uh, kind of time. Uh, yeah, when you watch Nosferatu, it's clearly the Dracula story, and depending on what version you've seen, the inner titles may even use the character names from Dracula. But when the movie was first released, those character names were very different. Professor Van Helsing became Professor Bulwer. Uh, Jonathan Harker became Thomas Hutter. Mina became Ellen, Dr. Seward became Dr. Seavers, Renfield became Nock, but the most important is that Dracula himself became Count Orlock, or Graf Orlock, depending on the poster that you saw. And it's a distinction that might seem somewhat trivial, but it effectively spun him off into a unique character that would change and grow down through the century. One of the things that, uh, that they did, that Prana Films did, well, as you just said, was that they changed a bunch of the character names and the location for where it takes place, it takes place in Germany instead of England. Uh, and then the ending is very different. Um, do you get a sense through your research that that was all done in order to try and skirt any copyright problems or was a lot of that? Again, we don't know. I mean, I guess that could have been thrown up as a, but if you were trying to do that, you wouldn't bill the film as freely adapted from Bram Stoker's. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I think these people were very impractical and uh, part of their going bank, they spent more money on the promotion of Nosferatu than they did uh, making the film. We do know that. Wow. So there may have been just a general <laughs> level of uh, incompetence and impracticability. Uh, 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 Grau did not get back into the film business anywhere after that. And um, Murnau chose not to talk about this film. <laughs> That's amazing. So, but okay. So you, you, asked, you asked earlier about yeah. um, the um, what was going on at the time Nosferatu came out. And uh, two things, World War I had come to a uh, uh, cataclysmic end. Right, and right. So had, so had the, um, uh, the Spanish flu epidemic, which right. persisted up to the year before Nosferatu was uh, uh, being filmed. And so this, uh, the publicity that survives from Nosferatu does liken the vampire uh, does liken Nosferatu to uh, uh, to the war itself? With any, the war is called a cosmic vampire that drained the lifeblood of 
of Europe and this the procession of um, uh, of coffins in the street that this plague imagery this this was also a first it's not anywhere in Dracula uh, right. but it obviously has something to do with uh, Europe in those uh, 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 days of the uh, of the flu pandemic interesting uh, which was um, uh, which rocked the world even more than COVID has. I mean, it, it's uh, what we uh, have just experienced or are still experiencing is uh, just a fraction of the, uh, of, 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 of the horror of it. So it, uh, it was not a, uh, it was not a quote unquote horror movie. It was not escapist entertainment. It was uh, self-consciously an art film in the way that uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari uh, was, uh, there were uh, uh, they were both anti-war statements, you know, in their in their own ways, gotcha. and and uh, they were presented with, uh, you know, uh, uh, a full orchestration, not a uh, not a rinky dink, uh, you know, piano accompanist, <laughs> and they, they were uh, the stuff of a night on the town, and not. Uh, you know, a Saturday matinee, uh, but it was America that you know took took a lesson. Uh, the commercial film industry here uh, imported a lot of uh, German talent uh, in the early uh, uh, '30s, uh, obviously escaping Hitler, and uh, took a lot of these techniques and uh, and talent and put them and invented this completely new category there there had been no supernatural horror films in america before universal did dracula there were terrifying really? there were terrifying characters usually played by lon cheney or, or or somebody like that but they were explained away as uh, human beings often gotcha. disfigured often or disguised or something um there were no real ghosts and uh, so universal felt it was taking a big chance with um with, with, with Dracula and it was a chance that, that paid off because it just <laughs> unleashed whole uh, uh, this, this energy uh, of the fantastic in, in the cinema that had been part of the European tradition from the very, very beginning, you know, from the trick films of Georges Méliès. I mean, there's yeah. a haunted castle. Uh, you, you see a, uh, a bat flittering through a castle and it turns into this, uh, this caped devil uh and it's uh it's it's uh right there at the very beginning of the motion picture uh something like dracula was was waiting to be uh facilitated right right and and you uh you 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 mentioned world war ii uh and uh something that i wanted to ask you about is that so when when Florence Stoker wins the lawsuit and the the decision is that all copies of Nosferatu have to be destroyed, uh, so the the film is almost entirely wiped out across the world, but a couple copies survived somehow, and so I guess this question is in two parts. So so the first part is where did these copies hide and how did they how did they reemerge? I think they uh, there 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 is no enforcement mechanism recorded, uh, you know, uh, for the destruction of these these films. Uh, they gotcha. they weren't they weren't shown publicly, but uh, people collected films. Uh, a lot of uh, you know discoveries uh, of lost silent films have uh, come from old movie theaters and the collections of people. Who, who ran them, and um, there were some variant, uh, at least one variant uh, version of it uh, that, that was made with, with new footage and different materials. Uh, but it took uh, the better part of uh, you know, the 20th century to uh, reassemble everything. Um, the, uh, and then when Florence Stoker was negotiating with Universal Pictures, a print showed up in uh, in the United States, a print had earlier shown up in in London, and she had to chase that down and and, and, and squelch it. And uh, that the print in New York 
was turned over to Universal for quote unquote purposes of destruction. And Universal, of course, did not destroy it. They they kept it. It's very clear that uh, uh, that uh, Todd Browning and uh, certainly uh, Carl Freund, the cinematographer, uh, looked at it carefully. There are enough visual uh, homages to Nosferatu, you know, in, in Dracula, but uh, that had to be the case. Uh, Interesting. And it was a pristine copy. They used a little snippet of it in a... Uh, comic short called Boo and less than a minute, you know, and it is the most crystalline shot the day before yesterday. Wow. Uh, of, of Nosferatu. And that print uh, was finally destroyed when Universal's new management uh, in the late 30s or in the 40s uh, just got rid of all of their, uh, they just junked all of their silent movie holdings because uh, they didn't see any commercial use for them sure. and things like uh, the phantom of the opera escaped because uh george eastman house uh, saw the value of it and uh managed to to rescue it but uh uh most of the movies ever made you know, the majority of uh films uh, in the united states and around the world are uh, uh do not exist today especially from the silent era but it was, uh, it was, it was kind of hard to see for a while because, you know, it was not owned by any uh, particular uh, film studio or distribution company. It was this uh, this kind of public domain oddity out there uh, that nobody really knew what to do with. It didn't. It was shown in 1929 in uh, in New York City the Film Guild Theater down in Greenwich Village. And that's the, um, uh, the copy that was, you know, uh, finally confiscated by, by Universal. And uh, it was shown in Detroit as well. I, as I, I found a, a record of that. Hmm. But it wasn't until after World War II, really, and the rise of, uh, you know, film studies that uh, I think the first print going around was a shortened half hour version that uh, was available on 16 millimeter. I remember uh, doing a screening of it myself. I, I worked at the local public library and I you know, uh, took care of the uh, audiovisual stuff and they booked this in and I uh, projected it for a small appreciative audience. And that was the first time I, I had seen it. And I, I was in high school then, that would have been the late 1960s. And uh, the 70s saw the stirrings of the first uh, serious interest, uh, academic interest in uh, film history. And German expressionism, you know, became recognized as a you know, major component of uh, world cinema history and uh, was duly covered in anywhere where uh, film history was being taught. And uh, films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu were among the uh, films that were most screened, you know, for students and uh, college audiences. And uh, it has only kind of gained steam, you know, over the, uh, over the years. And uh, as, uh, you know, especially as horror movies, uh, American horror movies took a lot longer to be uh, <laughs> recognized as uh, artistically important. Uh, <laughs> sure. Back, you know, back even in the 1970s uh, and, and later in film history books, you might be able to find Nosferatu in the index, but you wouldn't find Dracula, Frankenstein, James Whale, Todd Browning. Uh, they were still kind of beneath, uh, uh, beneath consideration. So when the destruction order came, and all copies of Nosferatu had to be destroyed. That was before World War II. And then the war broke out, and by the time it was all over, much of Germany had just been bombarded down to rubble. And there was an absence of German film history for a large part, just because of the destruction, and also because of the destruction of lives. 
uh, there, there was not, during the war, there wasn't that much being done in terms of art film or film for entertainment. And with so much destroyed, there was just a hole in German, uh, in German film at that time. And Nosferatu was completely absent. But then later, some decades later, uh, Nosferatu eventually reemerged in the world, and a copy of it made it back to Germany. And a brand new generation of Germans saw this amazing film that they maybe didn't even know had existed before. And one of those filmmakers was a young director named Werner Herzog. And he saw Nosferatu and was so captivated by it that he had to make a remake of it. And so in 1979, uh, his movie Nosferatu Phantom der Nacht was released. And this starred Klaus Kinski as the Count. And Herzog decided to put all of the original names from the Dracula book back in. So, so Kinski is not playing Orlock per se, even though he has an amazing makeup job, uh, but he is addressed as Count Dracula. And this film, although not necessarily a shot-for-shot -shot remake, is an amazing piece of art. It's haunting to watch. There is some incredible imagery, and the music is is so moody and wonderful that it will really stick with you for a long time after watching it. Then, in 1988, there was a movie that was released called Vampire in Venice, or Nosferatu 2. And this was a, uh, a project that was made by a producer named August Caminito, and forgive my Italian there, that was probably terrible, but he had seen Herzog's Nosferatu, and he was blown away by it, and he wanted to make a sequel to it. And he managed to secure Klaus Kinski to come back and reprise the role of the Count, uh, but set the story in Venice as sort of like, well, what, what happens what happens a hundred years later? Uh, and it's got, it also has Christopher Plummer in it and Donald Pleasance, and it is a mess. Evidently, Klaus Kinski was a, a, a monster both on and off set, and there were crew who abandoned the project, and actors who abandoned the project, and director abandoned the project, and August had to take over the directorial responsibilities, and uh, he shot a bunch of the rest of the movie, but the script had to keep changing because Kinski wouldn't do things, and he would just change things on the fly. And eventually, August just lost the will to finish shooting. He just didn't want to go back to that place. So he had to cut the movie together with the footage that he had and try to make a cohesive story. And that didn't work. Uh, when you watch the movie, it's, it's a disaster. It's very beautiful in most places. It, there are some really cool images in it from time to time. But you get to the end and you're like, okay, I don't know what the hell I just watched. So Vampire in Venice just becomes this sort of weird little footnote for Nosferatu and is just another example of a tangent that Count Orlock went off in that got the character further and further away from Dracula. And in fact, if you were to show a picture of Max Schreck from Nosferatu, a lot of people would say, oh, Nosferatu. Like, they, they actually recognize that silhouette 
of the character, but they probably don't even realize that that character was originally meant to be Count Dracula. After all, the most memorable parts of Nosferatu really have nothing to do with the Dracula story, for the most part. So, it makes sense that when people see Max Schreck as Count Orlok, it has such an effect on them that their memory of the movie is sort of like it's this unique thing, completely separate from Dracula. So, I, uh, so I guess uh, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to come back to was the, uh, the idea of you projecting a 16 millimeter copy of Nosferatu as, as a teenager in yeah. your local library? Yeah, was... I, I, was, I uh, had a part-time job after school. Uh, and one of the things I was responsible for was the uh, audiovisual stuff. Uh, one of the librarians, uh, I, it must have been near the Halloween season or something, and uh, booked in this uh, half hour version of Nosferatu. And um, it was fascinating. In fact, I, I did, I, I stayed after, I stayed late and I uh, projected it again for myself. I will. Really? That. Well, that can't surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I love that. I absolutely love that. And so, so when you eventually then, I'm assuming a little later on in life, saw the, you know, the complete version of Nosferatu, was that, was that an exciting eye-opening experience or? Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw a, a longer print of it, uh, it was still in ragged shape. You mm. know, not the, um, it, it, it would have been a very beat up print, something that made the rounds and, and um, there was no musical accompaniment, no, no, uh, no tinting, no restored intertitles, all that sort of thing. So, like everybody else, I had to wait until uh, uh, quite near the uh, millennium to uh, see the thing uh, fully restored. And um, now, it, here we are at the hundredth anniversary, and uh, I'm being asked to appear at commemorative events. Uh, Wonderful. The most, the most interesting. Well, the most interesting one is a a Nosferatu tribute at uh, in Santiago, Chile, in June. Uh, they wanted me to come talk about Dracula, and it was a, a few years ago, and it was derailed by COVID. And oh, uh, stayed in touch, and so they've revived the idea, and they're going to spotlight Nosferatu, and I'll be going down there for a couple of days in June, and uh, seeing South America for the first time. That's uh, excellent. If there are, if there is uh, any particular mystery that you still haven't figured out about Nosferatu, what what would that be? Like, what what would be the holy grail piece of information to finally come across for you? Uh, the actual German uh, court transcript. Uh, I would like to hear the voices of everybody <laughs> learned here. Why they think they could get away with this. Uh, and it dragged out and out and out and out. So there had to have been, uh, you know, I saw the, uh, the English, uh, uh, you know, pre of everything that uh, Florence Stoker was told by the Society of Authors. But uh, nothing, there are, there are researchers in, uh, in Germany who are still trying to find this stuff. And they keep uh, asking me if I, you know, uh, I may know something and have kept it under. <laughs> under <laughs> I, I No, I mean, I used every scrap of, uh, uh, you know, I used every bit of the pig, but the squeal and probably this added some squeal of my own to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, just what was going on? Oh, that's, that's a fabulous answer. Um, Mr. Skull, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for all of your research and all of your books. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you and it's wonderful to be able to hear you tell us about the things that you've found and discovered. So well, thank, thank you. you very much for your time. Thank you.
and uh, uh, best of luck with I'm fascinated by uh, you know Vampire's Castle. I want to uh, dig into it more myself. Oh, lovely! Oh, look, <laughs> I think I'm blushing. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you very much for saying that. No, uh, no, it's quite. Uh, I, I I like what I've seen so far, and uh, uh, bless you for doing it. There need to be more crazy people like ourselves. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, let's see what we can do about that. Oh, yes, David Skull. I have been obsessed with Nosferatu ever since I first learned about it in film school. And being able to talk with a film historian of David's caliber about this movie is just like another checkbox on my fantasy to-do list. And the guy could not be any easier to talk to. He was so nice and so knowledgeable. I mean, he, he literally wrote the book on vampire film studies. In fact, the interview that you just watched is only really half of what we talked about uh, because we got off on Dracula tangents all the time and he told me some amazing stuff about Dracula and Bram Stoker that completely blew my mind that I have never heard before uh, so I have taken all that out and I've held it back and I'll be releasing that as a separate episode that is just about Dracula but in the meantime you were probably wondering where can I watch a copy of Nosferatu well as it happens you can watch it right here on YouTube in fact, I'll put a link up and I'll put a link down below to where you can find it. But fair warning, uh, it is also a very ragged print, which is certainly charming in its own way. But it's also quite a bit shorter than the original version that was released. And presumably that just has to do with, uh, you know, a print would show up at a theater somewhere in the 1920s and uh, it would it would get played and the theater manager would be like, okay, start cutting stuff out of this because we need to be able to roll this many more times to get an extra screening in at the end of the day to get more ticket sales. So so it's so it's not complete. If you want to see Nosferatu as close to the original version that would have screened a hundred years ago, especially if you're a collector of vampire things, then I suggest the Kino Lorber version. And you can get that on DVD or you can get it on Blu-ray or you can uh, download it through iTunes or, or Amazon Prime. And it is a gorgeous digital remaster of Nosferatu. So it looks beautiful. And it also has the extra footage added back into it. So it is as, as close of a version to the original as we are able to get today. Uh, it also has the original intertitles uh, translated from the original German. So you are getting pretty much exactly what was on the screen back then with the original character names. So you get to see uh, you get to see Nosferatu as Count Orlok. Um, but it also has the, uh, the original score that was composed for it is performed on this version. So it really is the closest experience that you can get to what was originally screened uh, in Germany back in 1922. And, and it really is a cornerstone of any vampire collector's collection. I will also post a link to uh, Werner Herzog's 1979 remake of Nosferatu, which was shot in both English and German simultaneously. So you can really pick your poison on that. You can also watch Vampire in Venice, Nosferatu 2, currently on YouTube, so I'll post a link for that below in case you are ready for things to get really weird. And I, I also want to recommend a film that came out a couple years ago called Shadow of the Vampire. And this is a, it, it's sort of a retelling of the making 
of Nosferatu. But as if Max Shrek were an actual vampire who is eating the crew as they make the film. And it is so much fun. Willem Dafoe plays Max Shrek in just a, a, a career performance. Uh, and then also John Malkovich plays director F.W. Murnau, and, and he's amazing in it too. So it's, uh, I, I highly recommend this one. Nosferatu is an important movie in film history. It is the first monster movie, really. Uh, but it's also, for example, the first uh, silent film really to, the, the first silent narrative film to leave the studio and to go outside into the world to shoot footage for its story. But I think most importantly to us on this channel is that Nosferatu is the first vampire in cinema. And to be specific, there, there is evidence of two movies that were made and released before 1922, before Nosferatu, uh, that had Dracula in them as characters. Now, neither of those two movies have survived, so we don't we don't really know what they would have played like. But Nosferatu was a triumph of silent era filmmaking. It was the beginning of vampire film as a genre and this was the first time that anyone had seen a vampire destroyed by sunlight which is all over every vampire movie that came after it it was the first time anyone had seen a vampire moving as a shadow along the wall it was the first time that anyone had seen a vampire rising straight up out of their coffin. But most importantly, it was the first time that anyone had seen the vampire as a monster, the DNA of which has traveled down through vampire media as of this week for a hundred years. Bela Lugosi set both the image and the voice of the vampire in stone in 1931. But nine years earlier, in 1922, F.W. Murnau and Max Schreck set the vampire loose in movie theaters for the first time. Not with the vampire's voice, but with his terrifying silence. We'll see you next time.